it's super to have you, Phil. I know your your time is is certainly uh, valuable, and uh, uh, we're excited to hear from you. And all right, Phil, you're good to go. And thanks again. Good, terrific. Hi, to everybody. Um, thank you for asking me back. Um, as as was mentioned, actually, uh, this is my my second appearance in front of Novak. The first was back in 2005. For those who are are old enough to have been a member back back then, 16, well, almost 17 years ago now. Uh, had an astronomy day event that uh, I spoke at also. And in fact, my daughter was with me back back then also. We came down on Amtrak, toured the D, uh, DC, and then we we migrated to uh, to the site in Virginia. That was one wonderful event. I hope you're you're still still doing that kind of a thing as you did back then because it really was a standout event in my memory. So I really do appreciate your your having me back again. Um, to talk about a topic that's uh, near and dear to my heart and has been, for decades and decades, literally since night one, that I can say that, okay, this is when I became interested in astronomy, and that is binoculars. Because I've, I've lived by the creed since then that two eyes are better than one. Uh, because binoculars are, are certainly special in my life as an amateur astronomer, but just special in, in many amateurs' lives because they have a lot of benefits over monocular-type telescopes. And I want to explore some of that uh, this evening with you. Okay, we'll talk about binoculars. Not so much what you can see with them, although I will, I will touch upon that briefly at the very end of all this, but rather uh, a little more of the nuts and bolts, the mechanics of binoculars, the optics of binoculars, things like that. Uh, so in any case, uh, having said that, then we will, we will uh, proceed. I mentioned, as I get into this, um, brief history lesson. Let me start out with my history, and then I'll, I'll get to this. As I say, binoculars were a part of my, my astronomical career since literally nine, uh, uh, night one. And I can date night one exactly to Good Friday, April 1968. Um, I was a sixth grade student back then, and my science teacher, his name was Mr. Clark. I think his first name was George, if I remember. Anyway, we had done an astronomy unit that previous winter. And that came, that went, and we were on to bigger and better things. But then all of a sudden, astronomy came back up again because he told the class that there was going to be a total eclipse of the moon on Good Friday night in April of 68. And some of you who are maybe old enough to remember that, um, and in fact, I know several several good friends who, although we didn't know each other back then because we were in totally different states, that was their first night also, which I thought was kind of interesting. So it was this trigger event that many of us shared. Well, in any case, Mr. Clark said, okay, um, I'm going to assign you a homework. Um, I'm going to give you a homework assignment to look at this total eclipse of the moon. Well, it was a Friday night, Good Friday, as I mentioned. So we had a three-day weekend. And it was always his policy, Mr. Clark's policy, never to assign homework over a weekend. Okay. But he said, I'm going to break my rule. And you're going to have to look at the eclipse. And I want you to write a report of what you see. And that report is going to be due in Monday's class. The only way you can get out of this report is if it's cloudy. <laughs> well, of course, we were we were all praying it was going to be cloudy because I didn't want to look at it. Eclipse of the moon. I wanted to look at Gomer Pyle or something like that that was on Friday night on back on Channel Two, I think it was or, or CBS. So in any case, we were all hoping it was going to be cloudy. Sure enough, it was clear. You know, go figure what are the odds. And I went outside with a little card table, and I went outside with an old pair of binoculars, a family pair of binoculars, long since lost. And I looked at the eclipse. And while the eclipse lasted, you know, hour and a half or whatever it was, okay, um, I, I was watched the eclipse through those binoculars, and I can't, I can't describe what happened. I, be, I was transfixed with it. I still can't explain it. Uh, I was transfixed by it. I was just mesmerized by it. And that was the spark. That was the spark that here we are now, you know, 50-plus years later, uh, that I'm still, that spark is still burning inside of me for, for astronomy, for amateur astronomy. Now, of course, I've long since got, moved on to other, other optics, any of a number of different telescopes, any of a number of different binoculars, long since those 7 by 35s have been, you know, pretty much lost in history, probably were thrown out with the trash at one point or another inadvertently. Uh, but it was that event, and those binoculars were at my side at the very beginning of my my journey in the universe and so that's why i take them so near and dear to to my heart uh, anyway so enough about me though let's talk about this a brief history lesson who invented the first telescope anybody want to volunteer an answer who invented the first telescope somebody was a greek <laughs> no, no, no not, not that long ago 
Yeah, Hans uh, Lipperhey, as Nick says in the in the chapter, Lip, Lipperhey. They dropped the S some years ago. Apparently, it was misspelled all those all those years. But yeah, uh, <coughs> Jan or Hans uh, Lipperhey. He was a spectacle maker, eyeglass maker. Okay, and he just inadvertently. And some people say that it was actually his kids who were playing around in, the, in his room, you know, his workshop one day. But uh, in any case, he's the first one to figure out that if you hold two lenses not side by side but rather in line with each other, all of a sudden it made distant things look closer and small things look bigger. How about this? Who invented binoculars? That's an interesting question. Who invented binoculars? Anybody? Anybody? It wasn't the Cyclops. Same guy. Hans Lipperhey invented the first pair of binoculars. Now, in fact, dig a little bit deeper, uh, and here he is here. You see the years that he lived, 1608, well, only 11 years before his death. Uh, he invented the first telescope. Well, in December of that year, he was asked to actually invent a, a binocular version. Somebody had the, the foresight, and I'm not too sure who that somebody was, to say, hey, can you put two of them in line with each other? And sure enough, he did. In fact, there are some evidence, historical records, showing that uh, it was probably the first binocular, probably three or four power, probably 50 millimeters, two inches in aperture or, or less. And, and further records show that three out of four of the earliest documented telescopes were, in fact, binoculars. So not only were binoculars early in my career, they were early in telescopic astronomy. Galileo, although he didn't invent the telescope, nor did he invent the binoculars, he did come up with a design which he referred to as a celatone or celatone. I don't speak Italian. I have enough trouble with English, so I'm not too sure how to pronounce it. But it was essentially a binocular helmet. Now, what that looked like, something like this, I don't know. There are no records of the visible construction of it. You know, was it ever constructed? That nobody really knows for sure, but he at least is credited with the concept of this. He's also credited with coming up with the first binocular observing mount a gimbal chair, an observing chair in ships to try to compensate for the rocking, of course, when you're trying to view through binoculars uh, on board a ship. Now, whether or not that was ever made, again, records are inconclusive. But it shows the binoculars were a very, very early part of telescopic astronomy and our, our uh, discovery of the telescopic universe. I want to talk a little bit about, especially for those who are, are new to the hobby, and new to the concept of viewing with binoculars, and for that matter, even you veterans as well. Let's talk about some terminology with binoculars, okay? Because like pretty much any technical subject, you know, binoculars has its own language. There are some terms, for instance, that are unique to, to the discussion of binoculars that I'd like to just talk a little bit, what I refer to as, as binobabble. Uh, magnification, of course, we're hopefully familiar with that with a telescope, likewise with aperture. But then not everybody is familiar with terms like exit pupil or the different types of prisms that are used for binocular construction, coatings of the of the elements, the optical elements, the lenses, the prisms, and so forth, field of view, how big a swath of sky will be in the view of a binocular at a given time, eye relief, the distance you have to hold binoculars away from your eye in order for you to visualize taking the full field of view, interpupillary distance, the distance between your eyeballs, okay? and also different types of focusing as well. So we'll talk a little bit about all these concepts because if you're evaluating whether or not your binoculars that you happen to own are a good choice for astronomical viewing, or if you're in the market looking for a new or possibly a first pair of binoculars, you know, what are the things you need to look at? Because while some binoculars are wonderful for more terrestrial pursuits, bird watching, for instance, or uh, watching a sailboat race, or maybe looking at a local football game, things like that. Not all are created equal when it comes to nighttime viewing because, quite honestly, our needs as visual observers are greater, more exacting than they are for most birders and more terrestrial pursuits, in large part because we're trying to see such difficult objects, things that are right on the very threshold of visibility that may be visible in one binocular but invisible in another because some of these things may not be optimal. So let's take a look at, first off, some of the numbers. When we talk about binoculars, we always refer to them by pairs of numbers. So, and they're standard combinations that you'll see, 7x35, seven, seven or more, more correctly, it's pronounced 7 by 35 like a 2 by 4 piece of lumber, 7x50, 10 by 50, 10 by 50 uh, and so forth. These are fairly standard sets of numbers that you'll see. 
the first number that you see preceding the X, 7, 10, 16, and so on in my list, is the magnification, whereas after the X, that's the aperture. The diameter of the front lenses, the objective lenses, expressed in millimeters. So therefore, my old 7 by 35 binoculars magnified the, the moon, the eclipse of the moon I was looking at back in 1968, magnified it by a factor of 7, so it appeared in those binoculars seven times larger than it would have been perceived by my eye. And the front objective lenses were 35 millimeters across, a little better than an inch. It's just 25.4 millimeters, so a little better than, a, than an inch across. 7 by 50 binoculars, still 7 power, but now the front lenses, the objectives, are 50 millimeters, about 2 inches in diameter, uh, and so on. It's important to, to consider these numbers when you're evaluating if a pair of binoculars, a certain pair of binoculars, is applicable, suited for nighttime viewing, because not all are. Or that is to say, some are better uh, than others for nighttime pursuits. It's important to know th those numbers because they also determine what's referred to as the exit pupil. And that's really the thing you have to take into account, at least in my opinion. When you're trying to assess a, if a certain set of binoculars is suitable for nighttime viewing or not. Because the exit pupil is the diameter of the cylinder of light that's exiting the eyepiece, and that's what we're looking at now, the eyepiece end or the business end of, of the binoculars. The cylinder of light exiting the eyepiece into your eye's entrance pupil. Like for instance here, you see these are seven, if you can see my cursor, hopefully you can, uh, seven, uh, 10 by 50 binoculars, okay, 10 power, 50 millimeter objective lenses. To find out what that the diameter of that cylinder of light, the exit pupil, will be for this pair of binoculars, you simply divide the aperture, which is 50 millimeters, by the magnification, which is 10. So that tells you 50 divided by 10 gives you a 5 millimeter exit pupil. And that's what I'm trying to show in this diagram over here. The diameter of that cylinder of light, whatever you're aimed at, Exiting that eyepiece into your eye's entrance pupil is, in this case, 5 millimeters. That's why you have so many standard sets of numbers. 10 by 50 binoculars, no matter anything else you don't know about the binoculars, it doesn't matter in terms of the, the manufacturer and the design and so on. If I have a 10 by 50 binocular, the exit pupil is always going to be five, 5 millimeters. If I have a 7 by 35 binoculars, okay, 35 divided by 7. If I have uh, 12 by 60 binoculars, 60 divided by 12, uh, that sort of thing, okay? So it's important to know what the exit pupil is because not all exit pupils are suitable for nighttime viewing, or at least some are better than others. Depends a lot on you, actually. Also, it depends a lot on where you're using those binoculars as well. So I'll talk about some of that as I get a little bit deeper into it. It's also important to consider the type of prisms that are inside. Binoculars, referred to as prismatic binoculars, have sets of prisms inside that bounces the light around, light from the tar target, whatever we're looking at, passes through the objective lens into the optical system of the binocular, then bounces around through sets of prisms and pops out through the eyepiece with the image erect. In other words, up is up and down is down. If you're familiar with astronomical telescopes, different designs of astronomical telescopes will flip images around. Some will flip the image upside down, others will flip it left to right, and some will do both. But that's okay. okay. That's okay for astronomical telescopes because technically there is no up and down in space. Down is towards your feet. So I'm always looking up. So up and down really doesn't have any bearing when it comes to looking at the nighttime sky. Okay? And that's true for astronomical telescopes. But binoculars, binoculars are designed not primarily for astronomical viewing, but more for terrestrial viewing. And so the manufacturers, rightly so, want to make sure the view you're looking at through your binoculars has up is up and down is down and left to the left and right is right. So in other words, they want to keep the orientation. To do that, to do that, they pass through sets of prisms. Okay? Well, there are a couple of basic design prism assemblies in binoculars. So let's talk about them. Okay, We have, in general, roof prisms versus poral prisms. Okay. Roof prisms are very popular among birders, and rightfully so because they're very lightweight by comparison, they're very compact by comparison, and they produce very good images. Okay. Poral prisms are more familiar. Okay. They have the more familiar zigzag barrel design, like you see in my little profile uh, here, uh, zigzag barrel design, because of the the assembly of the prism, the design of the prisms inside the housing of the two binoculars. So let's take a look at each one. Okay, take a look at each. Uh, beginning first with poral prisms. Okay. 
again, if I was to cut a pair of poro prism binoculars in half, this is what I'm going to see. On the left-hand side, I have the objective lens. The red that you see the line, the line going through is simply the optical path. And so the light from whatever I'm looking at, which is off the left of my, in my illustration, the light will pass through not one but two prisms nested together, bouncing off surfaces. You see them numbered one, two, three, four, bouncing off the surface. And the process of this, this zigzaggy pass through the binocular housing pops out through the eyepiece with up is up and down is down and left is left and right is right. Okay, those are the most common type of binoculars probably in use in general, but certainly among amateur astronomers, poro prism binoculars. Then we have roof prism binoculars, most popular among birders, hikers as well, just in general nature watchers, because again, they're lighter in weight, smaller in size, and so they're easier to stuff into a backpack or maybe just carry around your neck with a case of some sort. Well, there are two different types of roof prism designs. The most common, Schmidt Peckham, which is what you're looking at here. Well, now follow the optical path. You're going to get seasick because it bounces from one surface to two into prism number two over here, three, four, five, then out through the eyepiece like so. So five optical surfaces it touches, as opposed to if you go back to the previous slide, you'll, you may recall that there were four optical surfaces uh, that the light encounters as it passes through the, the poro prism assembly. The more optical surfaces light touches, the more the chance for damage uh, to that light, aberrations of some sort. Okay? But to add to it further, por uh, roof prism binoculars have a problem. Poro prism binoculars, depending on what the type of glass is that the poro prisms themselves are made out of, they have what's referred to as total internal reflection. In other words, the light bounces completely through the prism assembly without having any of those optical surfaces illuminized okay, to direct the light through the, the correct path. Whereas roof prism binoculars, that's not true. You have to have illuminized surfaces involved. And whenever you touch aluminum, a little bit of the light is lost, okay, bit, which is why for telescopes, we look at these, these uh, premium or high reflectivity uh, coatings as opposed to more standard aluminized uh, coatings for our, our uh, telescopes, at least a lot of people do. So that's one drawback with, with roof prism binoculars, but especially with the Schmidt Peckhams. Now, these particular ones, they're the least expensive roof prisms you're going to find. Okay. As opposed to the next, the Abbey Koenig design. Now it only touches three optical surfaces, as you see over here. Okay. So you're going to get a brighter image, uh, a higher contrast image, just based on that alone. Okay. These are the higher end roof prism binoculars. They're really pricey. I mean, the images are outstanding. But this is the design, for instance, you will see in Zeiss binoculars, which is arguably the, the finest binoculars made. Okay. And other high-end ones also, like as another high-end one, and there are several others also. Uh, but those two, they, they likely use the Abbey Koenig design, at least in the, the higher-end models uh, that they sell. And again, it's preferable because you, you see now three versus five optical services, so the light transmission is going to be better, and you're going to have um, a brighter higher contrast image popping out the other side into, into your eye. As I'm going along, if you do have any questions, comments, whatever, uh, please feel free to uh, put them into the chat room. Okay. I'm uh, uh, watching it right here and, and so far we don't have any activity, but that's okay. You know, that's all right. Any questions at all, just, you know, please pop in and, and uh, or if you want to just ask a question, you know, by all means, unmute your mic and uh, go for it. Okay. Uh, another thing you want to consider when evaluating binoculars, not only the prism design, uh, but also the optical coatings. Because when you look at the moon, let's say I'm looking at a gibbous moon like you see in this picture here, I really don't want to see a ghost like I'm seeing to the, to the left of the real image, okay? Internal reflections. Well, optical coatings, both on the prisms, but also on the lenses themselves, go a long way to eliminate or at least greatly diminish uh, internal reflections like you see here. Are your binoculars coated? Do they have optical coatings? The binocular will tell a story on the tail stock. And I'm looking out the eyepiece end here and the objective lenses are off to the, the front over there. This particular tail stock for this particular pair of binoculars tells the story. Okay, everything I need to know is, well, almost everything I need to know is right there. First off, they're 15 by 70 binoculars. Okay, so 15, 15 power, 70 millimeter objective lenses, okay? Tells me the field of view, which is four degrees in this case. We'll talk about field of view in a little bit. 
tells me BAK4 prisms. We'll talk about that also. Uh, I alluded to it a moment ago, but I'll get into it a little bit more deeply uh, in a while. But then the coatings. See where it says fully multi-coated. That's really what you want to see. Those are the best of the best. Now, that's not to say that if you have a pair of binoculars right now, and you're hearing me talk about this, and you pull that pair of binoculars out of its case, and you look at the tailstock, and it says coated optics, or it doesn't say anything about the optics, optical coatings at all. I'm not telling you to throw it away, okay? If you want to get rid of it, I'll give you my address. You mail it to me and I'll have my collection because there's no such thing as a bad pair of binoculars. Just some are a little bit better than others. Okay? I will say that my second pair of binoculars that my parents got me as a Christmas gift back in 19, I want to say 1972. So I was still in high school at the time. Uh, they were seven by 50 binoculars, okay? And you look at them today, and I pull it out, and it will say, it doesn't say anything about the kinds of prisms. Uh, I also doesn't say anything about the coatings. Okay? I happen to know, just because I kind of looked at them, that the prisms are not, not the best, okay? and the coatings are not the best either. I love those binoculars. I mean, with those binoculars, I saw over 85 uh, Messier objects. And, so those, and those binoculars are still in my collection. I'm not getting rid of those, okay? Uh, they bought them for Christmas in 1972. They were $50 at a local uh, discount chain store in Connecticut at the time. Cal remembers Caldor, okay? Uh, but uh, that's where they got them. 50 bucks back in 1972. They're over $300 today. It's amazing the binoculars we can get nowadays for $300. So back then they were considered kind of low end. But nowadays for $300, you can get a really outstanding uh, pair of binoculars. But in any case, um, so you're looking for the coatings. What type of coatings does your binocular have? Well, in this case, this picture was not taken through these binoculars. I can tell you that right now because the, these binoculars where the picture was taken don't have any optical coatings. And that's part of the problem uh, that we're seeing this, this ghost image of the moon in this case. But you have to kind of read a little bit between the lines. You look on the tail stock of the binoculars. And it might say coated optics, okay? Coated optics, say, okay, well, that's what he said, coated optics. Are, yeah, but, again, read between the lines. If you see the word coated, that means that there is a single layer of optical coating. is magnesium fluoride, typically, is what they, what they use if you're interested in the chemistry part of it. A single layer of magnesium fluoride on at least one lens surface, okay? But I don't want the coating on just one lens surface. I want the coating on all optical surfaces. So therefore, it's better to see fully coated. Fully coated means just that. There's a single layer of magnesium fluoride on all air-to-glass surfaces. That includes optical surfaces, lenses, but also prisms as well. Okay, they're all, they're all coated. Okay. So one way you can tell if you have coated or fully coated optics, take a look at the binocular. Look, hold it at arm's length. Look at the objective lens from arm's length and look at it at a, a rather steep angle to a light. It could be a room light could be the sun. Don't look at the sun. That's not what I'm saying. But you want bright light to shine off of, at an angle now, the surface of the lens. And if you see sort of a purplish tint, like you see in my, my picture over here, that tells you either that surface is coated, but if they're saying fully coated, that means that all the surfaces are coated with a single layer. The purplish color tells you a single, a single layer. As opposed to multi-coated or fully multi-coated. Now, fully multicolored, that means there are multiple layers, microscopically thin layers of magnesium fluoride applied to at least one lens surface. Fully multicolored means that multiple layers of magnesium fluoride have been applied to all air to glass surfaces. How can you tell if it's multicolored versus coated? Again, do that test. Hold it at arm's length, look at a bright light off at an angle so you see the reflected color. And if it appears sort of a, a really weird looking greenish quality to it, that means multicoated or fully multicoated. Okay. Again, purplish, kind of a purplish color means coated, single coating, whereas this kind of strange greenish uh, color is going to say uh, multicoated or fully multicoated. Now, what you don't want to do is get a pair of binoculars that claim they have ruby coated optics, okay, ruby coated. Ruby, wow, sounds really good. Ruby, ooh, that's fantastic. Worked for Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz with the ruby slipper, so ruby coated must be good, right? No, no. As a matter of fact, ruby coated, there you might as well not have any coating at all. I'm not too sure what 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 compound they're using for coating, uh, but they don't work. 
Okay, they don't work. They're, they're going to be fraught with reflections. Likewise, you might see some of the advertiser green coating. Okay, if it's a really em emerald green, like you see in my my right picture over here, that's no good either. If it's sort of a weird greenish purplish almost kind of color, like you see in the second picture to the left, that means multicoated. That's a good thing. Okay, but the manufacturer is going to tell you this also. If it's multicoated, that's a selling point. They're going to tell you. If they advertise ruby coated or green coated, that's a smoke screen. So again, they're not going to work well as well for astronomical viewing as some of the other options that you might find. Field of view. Also, take that into account. The span of sky that you're going to take into the field at a given at a given glance. On the left hand side, you have my seven by fifty binoculars dating back to to 1972. Extra wide field. It tells me that I have a field of view 525 feet at 1,000 yards, but then it also says field of view 10 degrees. Whereas over here, 15 by 70s, it says field of view is 4 degrees. Most manufacturers of binoculars, again, are more interested in terrestrial than they are astronomical pursuits. And so they probably will not quote the real field of view like these two examples do. That's the exception, not the rule. Instead, it's much more common that they will quote a number of feet at a thousand yards, or maybe the, the metric equivalent of that, depending on the origin of the binocular. But 525 feet at a thousand yards, for instance. So well, what the heck does that mean? Simply as a way of equating, at a, on a terrestrial scale, the span of the field of view. For instance, here, eight by 40 binoculars, 378 feet at a thousand yards. Okay, you notice it says coated optics, so they're mediocre. Okay, they're not great, they're mediocre. What does that mean? That simply means that those binoculars, if I was to look at a, a uh, ruler, 370, 378 feet long from 3,000 feet away, 1,000 yards, that ruler, 378 feet long, would just fit into the edges of my field of view. That's all that says. Okay. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't have a 70, 378 foot ruler hanging around to prove them right or prove them wrong but i do have the nighttime sky and so if i want to now convert this terrestrial unit to more astronomical interest i simply divide their number by 52.5 that's the conversion factor okay so if i divide 378 by 52.5 that tells me that these binoculars will take in 7.2 degrees of sky and i can actually check that if i if i didn't trust them I could check it uh, easy enough against two two stars, you know, in, in the sky that happen to be that that separation apart. So that's the that's what that means. So if you have a pair of binoculars and you say, okay, so so many feet at a thousand yards, what the heck are they talking about? Uh, from an astronomical point of view, just take that number, however many feet it is, divide by fifty two and a half, and that's the the span of sky. Now with seven power binoculars, you'll probably see fields of view that would cover you know, somewhere around maybe six seven degrees of sky, maybe up to eight degrees. If you recall my 7x50s, one reason I like them so much, they take in a 10-degree field of view, extra wide angle. Now, admittedly, the edges are really soft, really, really soft. So they're not nearly tack sharp. They're tack sharp, I don't know, 60%, 70% of the field, and then it kind of goes goes mushy on me. Uh, but uh, I just enjoy the view. Okay, admittedly, it's kind of soft on the edges, but I like the view because it takes in such a, a big field of sky. More common with 7x50 binoculars, again, six, seven degrees of sky, maybe up to eight degrees of sky. Uh, 10 by 50 binoculars, higher magnification, it's gonna be a smaller field of view, you know, five, six degrees of sky, uh, something like that, and so on. Eye relief is important. The distance that you must keep your eye from the eyepiece to see the entire field of view, okay? just like this. Okay, so if my eye is right here, and I'm this distance away, and I see the full field of view, well, this linear measurement, whatever it is, typically expressed in millimeters, is going to be the eye relief value, the eye relief value. That's important to know because if you have to hold the binoculars too close to you, okay, in other words, the eye relief is, is minimum, uh, it's going to be very difficult to hold them comfortably. Likewise, you don't want a pair of binoculars that you have to hold them at arm's length away to take in the field also, because now you're trying to support the full weight of those binoculars just by your two hands, your arms are going to get tired. And that's not the way to go either. So a, a, a nice range of values. 
ones that I think are very good would have an eye relief, stated eye relief from the manufacturer of uh, anywhere from 18 to 22 millimeter. I wouldn't go want to go much more than 22 millimeters because, again, you're, you're now balancing this way out. You can't leave it out in front of you. Good value is 15 to 18 millimeter. Now we're getting kind of weaker with the 13 to 15 millimeter, and I think anything less than uh, 13 millimeters, for my money, is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. Uh, so that's that's what you're looking for. It's especially important to take this into account if you must wear glasses when viewing. Now my glasses here, I'm 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 nearsighted. Okay, so I I could take them off, look through a telescope or binoculars, just focus the the view, and I have a perfectly nice nice experience. But my daughter has astigmatism. And so if you wear corrective lenses like she does to, to fix things like astigmatism, you must wear your glasses, okay? or you're not going to be able to focus the view no matter how, how much you try. In that case, it's especially important for you to have a decent ex, uh, ex, um, rather eye relief, I should say, eye relief value. So I would go toward the 18 to 22 millimeter if you have to wear eyeglasses. Uh, if you don't have to wear eyeglasses, then you can go 15 to 18, even down to 13 I, I wouldn't want to go less than 30. I mean, think if you're viewing through a telescope, same idea, right? You want a, a fairly decent exit, uh, eye relief rather, uh, just so you can view it comfortably as opposed to having to literally bury your head into the eyepiece. And that's essentially the same with binoculars as well. I mentioned the term also interpupillary distance, the distance between your eyeballs. What are they? Are they narrow? Are you beady-eyed? Or are you, you, you have a wide space between your, your eyes and so forth? The binoculars will be adjustable to some degree because it's a central hinge. And so you can turn the binoculars to adjust the interpupillary distance. But the question is, what is your inter interpupillary distance? Many manufacturers will quote a range. And say, okay, our, our binoculars will be able to support an interpupillary distance between this and that. Well, if you're outside of the this or that range, you're not going to be able to view the binoculars. Here's how you're going to do it. If you just want to check it for yourself, you want to get yourself a ruler, short ruler, you know, short thing like so, that's divided into millimeter units. That's what you want to do. Okay, so you get a ruler uh, with millimeter units. You then stand in front of a mirror. Bathroom mirror, for instance, is perfectly fun, uh, good. But anyway, a, a mirror, whatever. You then want to close your, I say to close your left eye. You could close your right eye if you wanted to, but in any case, you want to close one eye. Close your left eye, I say, to center your right pupil. So I'm going to center the ruler, the zero mark of the ruler, right on my right eye, like so. Okay. Again, my left eye is closed. I'm looking through, I'm looking rather into the mirror, and I see this. Okay. I then, without moving anything, I open my left eye, and then I'm going to look exactly at the measurement, millimeter mark, that lines up perfectly with the, the left pupil. That's my interpupillary distance. That's what I want to know. Okay, so that's that's the the suggestion. You want to double check to see what that is. A friend of mine who um, uh, has used my my ten by fifty binoculars, which are my most used binoculars, he says he has trouble because his eyes are separated just out of the range of these binoculars. And admittedly, the binoculars that I have my ten by fifties. The interpupillary range is not as great as I've seen others. I mean, it work, they work fine for me, but they aren't as, as great as some that I've seen. And so he has trouble. So therefore, while the binoculars are great for me, not going to work for him simply because he can't take in both, both views with, with the eyes. So things like that you have to consider also. Uh, Bill asked in the, in the chat room here, I just noticed it popped up, says the thin instruction manual accompanied by my 30-year-old uh, roof prism lights, 10 by 40s, Call them, yeah, trying to that that was um, that's just a a trade name that they used, I believe. Uh, the lights that you're talking about, that's just a trade name. Um, does that refer to the mirror system? Is it different than Abby? Uh, by mirror, I think I assume you mean the prism. I'm not too sure. I'm not familiar with those. So I, I mean, trying to that's just a line of binoculars that they produced. But uh, whether or not those are the um, uh, Abby Koenigs or uh, um, or the Schmidt Peckham, you know, that sort of thing, I don't know. You know, that I'm not too, I mean, you could probably contact them. They may know, but if it's 30 years old, you know, they may not. I'd almost bet they're Schmick, Pe Schmick Peckhams because I believe they were the first ones around. So I, I'd almost bet they were them. But I, I wouldn't want to swear by that because I'm, I'm just talking air right now. I'm not too sure. 
As far as focusing goes, basically two way of getting it done. Center focus, which is by far the most common. Okay, you center wheel in between the barrels and you, you turn and both eye pieces move in and out simultaneously versus individual focus, like so. Many binoculars, including my Fujinon uh, 16 by 70s that I have, uh, have individual focus uh, eyepieces because they want to maintain air tightness. The binoculars have been purged of air and filled with dry nitrogen to prevent internal fogging and, and so forth. And often trying to make an airtight seal to maintain the, the nitrogen inside the perils. Um, a center focus binocular will not ma necessarily maintain that air tightness. The idea, of course, would be nitrogen uh, filled and so forth. You want to minimize internal fogging and such. Whereas binoculars that don't have that airtight seal, all kinds of nasty stuff. It turns into a petri dish, depending on how you're focus how you're storing these things, because moisture gets inside. Then you put it into a black sealed box, the, the carrying case that is, and all of a sudden, you know, all all these spores just love that environment, damp and dark. And so suddenly you have this this experiment going on inside your binoculars in terms of mold growing and you know all that nasty bad stuff. So that's why you you know the the individual focus try to prevent that. Now I will tell you that many manufacturers have perfected this with center focus. So if you have a pair of center focus binoculars and they say nitrogen filled and so forth, the odds are pretty good if they're if they're relatively new, the odds are pretty good that uh, they are in fact uh, still sealed and filled with nitrogen. So that, that's a good thing there. But always keep an eye out, look inside the barrels and you wanna see if you see any discoloration on any of the surfaces, optical surfaces or inside the barrels for that matter. Because if you see any anything going on in terms of, of growth, <laughs> that tells you that they weren't quite as sealed and dry and stored as well as they, they probably should have been. Those are some of the things you need to keep in mind when you're looking to purchase a pair of binoculars. Because again, caveat emptor, definitely. Uh, you want to make sure you know exactly what you're looking for before you really go shopping. Especially in this day and age where everything is being done online, for better or for worse. So you really need to get the binoculars from a reputable supplier, number one, but also get a reputable name uh, as well. If you go onto Amazon, not to pick on Amazon, but if you go on Amazon and just start looking at binoculars, if you want to find, do something kind of entertaining, do that one day. And you'll see all kinds of claims being made by these brands that you never heard of because they're probably shipped direct, direct from the um, factory in Asia to you. And so quality control and so forth might be a little bit questionable as opposed to getting from a, a known supplier and more importantly, a known manufacturer. So these are the questions you have to ask. You know, what magnification am I looking for? Both magnification as well as aperture. Understanding, of course, the larger the objective lens is the heavier the binocular. So if you're gonna be supporting it by hand, that's something you have to take into account, certainly. The exit pupil must match you as well as your observing location in order to get optimal results. And the coatings and the prisms and, and all that have to be taken into account as well. Also support at the bottom. How are you going to hold these things? So things like that. A couple of bino myths that I hear about all the time. First off, bigger is better. Absolutely not true. I can't tell you how often since I write the, the binocular universe column in astronomy. I've been doing that for years and years and years now, over a decade. I, I will get... Um, emails and uh, comments from readers all the time saying, oh, gee whiz, I love your column. I have a pair of 20 by 60 binoculars and I'm having trouble holding them. Well, yeah, no kidding. They weigh a ton and they're magnifying all these jitters that you're, you're trying to support these things by hand. They're magnifying it by a factor of 20. So you're never going to be able to support them by hand. A lot of people I've found new to astronomy and new to binocular astronomy immediately gravitate toward the larger binoculars. And that's a bad choice, a okay, bad choice. Uh, bigger is not better, especially for a first pair of binoculars. Bigger is not better at all. In fact, if anything, it's a detriment. But how are you going to support them? Now, my daughter now, taken years and years and years ago, um, holding binoculars. But the way that I recommend holding binoculars, no matter what size you have, could be large, could be small, you notice what she is doing. She's not gripping the binoculars around the prism housing, which would be right about you know, right about there. Okay. Instead, she's supporting them first one side her cheekbones, and the outer end of them, okay, the objective lens end of them, by her hands there. If you hold the binoculars instead around the prisms, 
Okay, you have essentially a cantilevered weight, a diving board in front of you, and you're going like this because all the weight's in front of you. So that's not a balanced load. But by supporting them at either end, it's much easier to hold them steadily. If you're going to be holding binoculars by hand, my recommendation is you don't want to go higher than 10 power. Now, some people will say, well, I can hold 12 or 15 power. And my response to you is, uh, to, if you could do that, then God bless you. Okay, that's great. Okay, I can't. At least not for any length of time. And not for any length of, I mean, I can for a few seconds, but not for any length of time. So I find that for me, at least 10 power, probably the best maximum magnification I'd go with. And also 50 millimeter for the objective lenses. Anything bigger, again, they're going to be heavier. So if I have a pair of 10 by 70 binoculars, for instance, still 10 power, but the 70 millimeter objective lenses being larger, obviously, are going to be heavier. And I find that to be a challenge also. So again, just for my my money, I would go for handheld binoculars. I think 10 by 50 would probably be the, the best combination. Well, what if you need more power? What if you want more power? Let's say you have 10 by 50 binoculars and you want to go up. Okay? Well, what can you do? There are a couple of options. First off, image stabilized binoculars. How many of you own image stabilized binoculars? They're incredibly popular these days. Dave shaking his head no. Um, but that's okay. Uh, go ahead, uh, Jeff Ball. Uh, question? Let me your mic and, and go for it. No, I just have image stabilized. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, you're just saying, yes, I do. Okay, that's good. Yeah, they're they're great. Uh, the ones that you see, Canon, uh, Zeiss, uh, Fujinon, uh, they see in these pictures over here, the optics, especially in the Canons and the Zeiss, and not to take anything away from Fujinons, the optics are astonishing in those, astonishing. But hold on tight. You talk about sticker shock. Start looking at the numbers. And you'll see that Canon, even the smallest ones they make, which I believe are 10 by 30 image stabilized binoculars, you're, if you're not prepared, just be sitting down because the numbers are pretty high. Okay? I can get a much larger non-image stabilized binocular uh, for the same price I can get those. Now, again, the optics are astonishing. And the technology, I think, is great. I think it's great. You know, it's, it's, it's the magic that goes on inside of these things. To image stabilize the, the view is really amazing. Here's why I don't have a, a pair. Okay, a couple of reasons, first off. I've tested out several of them. And you know what's funny with me? And this is just me. Um, I get seasick when I look at them. Do you believe that? I'm very, I'm very, image, I'm very prone to, to seasickness. I can take a bottle of water and just shake it. If I look at it too closely, I'm going to get seasick just looking at the water inside. It's almost that bad. But um, I noticed that if I'm holding them and I hit the activation button, which is on the you know, right over here, for instance, I hit the activation button, and the image just stops dead in its tracks. It's amazing. But I get the sense that my head is still moving a little bit. That plays with my head, and I get seasick just based on that. That's me. Okay, that's me. But here's a more important consideration. Binoculars. Regardless of the size binocular I use, could even my 10 by 50s that I have, I always put them on a tripod. And here's why. Okay? When I view through binoculars, it's sometimes I'll take them out just for a quick casual look, of course. But when I'm looking through binoculars, I use them as I would with a telescope. I'm looking for specific targets. You know, that's what I'm looking for. It could be an article I'm preparing to write or it could be just for my own interest. But I'm always looking for a specific set of targets. And so as I would with the telescope, I have my finder charts and I have all this stuff set up on a table adjacent to me. Well, you ever try to start hop through a handheld pair of binoculars? You look at the chart, say, okay, here are the stars I have to go to. Here's the target. Here, okay, so I have to go from this star to that star to that star and that sort of thing. You know, I, I find my path, right? So I, I know where I'm going to start. So I, I look at the chart. I put the chart down, I take the binoculars, I start. I say, okay, there's the first star, and I go to this second star. Now where do I go? Put the binoculars down, go back to the chart. I say, okay, and I go to the chart, star three, star four. I pick the binoculars by hand back up again. I have to start all over again. I have to find the initial, then the second, then the third, then the fourth. And this up and down uh, it just takes forever. But if I put them on tripod, then I just let the binoculars go, and they stay there, obviously. So that's why I, I prefer tripod mounted binoculars over image stabilized. Okay. But, uh, but again, I can't argue with the optical quality outstanding. I can't argue with the technology. I think it's amazing. Uh, but you know, it depends on your, on your approach with them. Of course, I know many people who just live and die by them. 
So uh, I, I would certainly recommend them if you have that interest. Another myth about exit pupil. Bottom myth number two is 7 by 50 binoculars are the best night glasses. You ever hear that? 7 by 50 binoculars, they are night glasses. They are the best for nighttime viewing. No, that's not true. Okay. Now, where that myth started from, I don't know uh, for a fact. However, it's my understanding that the Navy started to adopt 7 by 50 binoculars as their preferred night vision back in World War II, night vision glasses in World War II. So I, I'm suspecting that that fake news began back then, that all of a sudden these uh, 7 by 50 binoculars were the, were the best for nighttime viewing with the seven millimeter exit pupil. That's largely because your pupil, of course, your eyes pupil will, will expand and also contract depending on the level of light that you're viewing. You ever go to an eye doctor, they put the drops in, all of a sudden you can't see anything because your eyes, are, your pupils are dilated and you have to wait for, for minutes and minutes and minutes to even go outside in a, a bright sunny day because you can't see a thing. Well, that's because your eyes, your pupils dilate under dim light or chemically induced by these drops. And that's what you want, of course. You want your eye's pupil to be as fully dilated as it could possibly get under dark sky because that's when you can take in the, the, most, the most stuff in the nighttime sky. Well, if you take a look at studies, studies will say that the human eye, uh, the pupil will dilate to about seven millimeters, that's the general statement, and contract down to maybe about three, two or three uh, millimeters in bright, bright light. So, you look, okay, seven millimeter exit pupil would match my eye's entrance pupil. So seven by 50, 50 divided by seven is 7.1. So that's my, there's my seven millimeter exit pupil coming out of these. But again, that's not, that's really not what you're looking for. Here's what you want. While many general sources will quote the dilated pupil of the human eye up to seven millimeters, that's not always the case. Ideally, the exit pupil of your, of your binocular should be less than or equal to the entrance pupil of your eye. You don't want the other way around. You don't want the exit pupil of the binocular to be larger than your eye's entrance pupil. That you don't want for a couple of reasons. Reason number one is you're wasting some of the light gathering ability of the, of the binocular because you can't take it all in. But also number two, uh, it's also going to result in somewhat lower image contrast. In other words, the, the background sky is going to look a little bit brighter than wood with a smaller aperture for the same magnification, or a smaller aperture. So there are a couple of things playing against it. So here's what you want. Now, when you were younger, when I was younger, okay, and by younger, I mean somewhere in our, our mid to late teens, our eyes probably did dilate to a full seven millimeters. Okay? And that's what, under dark sky conditions, viewing through a binocular, that's probably the, the situation. The diameter of the exit pupil from the binocular over here equals the diameter of the entrance pupil, if you will, in your eye. But older eyes under more light polluted conditions, the situation on the right is much more likely. The eye is not dilating to seven millimeters. Nope, it's dilating to maybe four or five tops, maybe not even that, depending on situations. And yet you still have a seven millimeter exit pupil coming out. You're not taking all the light into account taking advantage of it, but also in the process, it could also result in a diminishing of the, of the contrast. And if we're looking for a dim object against a, a low contrast surrounding sky, you're going to miss the dim object for lack of, of image contrast. So how do you know? Here's a chart that I grabbed from a, a, a source called Vision Research, November 99. Okay, so it's dated a little bit now, but I haven't been able to find anything newer that, that seems to say other numbers. So I stick with this chart. Uh, this took a look at age from, well, they, they went back to zero just for the sake of the chart, I guess, but 20, 40, 60, 80 years of age versus the fully dilated pupil in millimeters under perfectly black conditions, okay? In other words, the best situation. And they plotted data out. They found out that when you're between 10 and 20, you're in your, your teenage years, that's your prime because your eye could dilate, the pupil could dilate under perfectly black conditions, up or two over seven millimeters, okay? seven and a half, at least this study quoted. But look what happens. As you get older, <laughs> so many things start going to, going to pieces as you age, and that's exactly what happens with your, your eye's pupil. It doesn't dilate. 
even on the exact same conditions. By the time you're 20, you're on a long slope downward. Okay? 30 years old, 40 years old, now you're not even at seven, you're six and a half. Keep on going to 50 years old, now you're at six. Again, these are under ideal conditions, keep in mind, okay? Uh, five and a half by the time you get to be 60, five when you get to be 70, and then 80, and it sort of drops off because I guess people don't look anymore. But uh, you see things drop off pretty quickly and on a fairly linear, right? So fairly, it kind of curves a little bit toward the 70, 80 year old span, but it's fairly linear, which I think is kind of interesting. So here I am, I'm now 65. So you take a look and under perfect conditions, and I don't know from perfect conditions, not where I live, but you see that I'm not even making it to six millimeters anymore. So it would make absolutely no sense for me, even if I did view under perfect conditions, and my backyard is anything but, just like I'm sure yours likewise, unless you travel someplace, um, it would make no sense at all for me to have, let's say, um, uh, 11 by 80 binoculars or 10 by 70 binoculars because of the large exit pupil. I can't take, I can't take advantage of it. Okay. So again, that's why, again, five millimeter exit pupil, that's a great way to go. Because even on dark, really dark conditions, by really dark conditions, I mean the desert Southwest. You know, I mean, maybe Cherry Springs, um, you know, other Spruce Knob, maybe, you know, things like that. Under really dark conditions, that's what my eye would get to. So where are you on this chart? Those are things you have to take into account as well. Some manufacturers will talk about twilight factor as opposed to exit pupil. Exit pupil is really the, in my opinion, kind of the gold standard that you're judging things to. Um, they talk about this, though, twilight factor. That's a smoke screen. They say it's the square root of the magnification times the aperture. And it doesn't really work. Okay, so if you do see somebody um, talking about their twilight factor being superior, consider exit pupil. That's a much more, um, it's a much better way of, of uh, clarifying the results you're going to get. Twilight factor, like I say, to me has has really no 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 bearing or no merit. What type of prisms are you going to be using? Well, are we going to go with poro? Are we going to go with roof prisms? Again, most most amateur astronomers go toward poro prisms. And here's why. Specifically, they look for poro prisms made from BAK4 glass. That's the spec you're looking for, BAK4 glass, because there's better light transmission. BAK4 glass has a higher index of refraction than the cheaper BK7 glass. Okay. The higher index of refraction allows all the light that enters the, the prisms to bounce around and come out the other side without having any optical surface illuminized okay, for added reflection. BK7 glass, not so much. I have to have an illuminized surface. And again, whenever light hits an illuminized surface, a little bit of it is lost. Okay. So therefore, BAK4 prisms are probably the, the better choice. And you can see with the 15 by 70s, it tells you very clearly BAK4 prisms. My 7 by 50s, my, my $50 pair of 7 by 50s from 1972, BK7 glass. I love them to death. Okay, And so if you have a, a binoculars with BK7 glass, love them to death, just like I do my, my 7 by 50s. But if you're looking for a new pair of binoculars, Keep this sort of stuff in mind as you're going along. Now, again, the manufacturer should tell you, but what if they don't? What if they don't? Well, that immediately makes me suspicious. But you can find out yourself. Take the pair of binoculars, take them outside, hold them up to the sky. Again, not the, not the sun, please. Don't do that. But against the bright surface, you can do it against a, a lit wall, interior wall for that matter. Hold them at arm's length, looking through the eyepieces. And you're going to see the, the exit pupil, right? cylinder of light. You see a circle? If you see that that circle is slightly grayed off, like you see in the left-hand picture over here, sort of a diamond shape, without knowing anything else, I can tell you those prisms are BK7, as opposed to BAK4, which is evenly illuminated across the entire exit pupil. See the difference? So if you see this, with a little grayed off angles like so, more or less diamond, diamond shape, BK7, fully illuminated, BAK4 because of the higher index of refraction. The light drop off because of the, the um, uh, illuminizing causes that diamond shape that you see with BK7 glass. Roof prisms, again, big bucks, big bucks. 
Why? Well, the common designs that you see over here, Abbey Koenig, Amici also, which I didn't mention, but that's another another possibility, not nearly as common though. Uh, Schmidt Peckham and such. Um, they're great, but they must be assembled under very tight tolerances. Okay, very high precision assembly for the prisms to work correctly. Even if off by just a smidge, you're gonna end up with a double image. And so that's why quality control is so critical when it comes to roof prism, regardless of the roof prism design. Very, very critical, the quality of, of the assembly. Another concern is that you want multi-coated optics, fully multi-coated optics, but you want to make sure you see phase corrected coatings or phase correction coating. Either way, either way. What that here's the problem. Inside roof prism binoculars, the internal reflections split the light into two slightly out of phase beams and the result ends up in lower contrast and therefore uh, less resolution as well but these code and that was a problem that plagued uh, roof prism binoculars for years years and years well technology has kind of caught up with the problem and i can't give you an exact date when when this was introduced but these so-called so phase correcting or phase correcting or phase correction coatings they force the split light back into phase with each other and so you end up with a, a, a higher image contrast and also higher brightness as well. So if you are looking at a pair of roof prism uh, binoculars, always make sure you see phase corrected optics, okay? Because that's really what you're looking for for that reason. Abbey Koenig are the best, okay, in terms of, of uh, image quality. But again, the other two have come a long way, especially if they have phase corrected optics. Now, I, I tested for astronomy. Uh, this goes back a couple of years ago now. Celestron rolled out what I consider to be a, a very reasonably priced uh, line series of roof prism binoculars, and we got a we got a, a pair of the magazine, and um, I took a look at them, and I was really impressed with the quality of the images because, quite honestly, I thought they were going to be kind of mediocre. And then, eh, okay, you know, roof prism at this price point, I think it was one hundred fifty dollars, something like that, for ten by fifties. I thought, eh, okay, the image is going to be mediocre. I was amazed. I really was, because of this these phase corrected coatings. That was always the high-end stuff, but trickle-down technology has now made them much more affordable. So I think that's terrific. I, I like. I got to admit, I did like those binoculars. They were very, very good um, for for roof prism, especially at that price point. About the best I'd ever seen. Talked about iris, but just quickly to reiterate it. Again, you know, you're looking at this range, especially if you have glasses, you have to worry about. So the 18 to 22, I think, is probably the way to go. You can get away also 15, 18, maybe. Okay. more toward the 18 end of it than the 15. Uh, but uh, again, go toward 20. Above 22, I wouldn't do that. My, my 10 by 50s have 22 millimeter eye relief. I don't have to wear glasses, but uh, they're still very comfortable to use. Things also you look for, which you can't really determine until you actually have them in hand and you look at the sky, are aberrations. Things you're looking for that aren't quite what you want to see. Astigmatism, not in your eyes, but rather with the binoculars. The image in the center is, is nice and sharp and focused, but toward the edges, you have all these little arcs all the way running, running radially around the, the outer circumference of the field of view. That's a stigmatism. That's a problem if you see that. Another problem you have is distortion. You look at something like, let's say, the moon. You want to see a nice circular moon in the center of the field, but you also want, as you move it off to the edge, you want to make sure that it stays circular as well. If you see the moon looking something like this, toward the edge, that means you're suffering from field distortion. That's another optical flaw. Field curvature, the images are sharp in the middle, but they're bloated, out of focus around the edges. And then you focus on the stars at the edges, and then in, the stars in the middle are out of focus and bloated as well. That's the result of field curvature. Some of these aberrations, some of these optical imperfections, you could check for on your own just uh, viewing at nighttime sky. Others you can actually do in daytime as well. Lateral color, chromatic aberration, all the purple fringes, you see yellow fringes around some of the stars. Uh, lateral color is a problem with some. You can check for field curvature certainly during the day as easily as at night. You focus on something, let's say here, a nice, nice flowering bush or a tree. And off to the side, you see how they're very, very, the, the curve of the field. Okay, You can see that they're sort of, arcs around like so. That's an example of field curvature. 
we all look at what's referred to as barrel distortion, look at a brick wall. You know, take a look at the lines, look at the horizontal lines, okay? The middle one is nice and straight. It's the course of bricks goes right across straight like so, but look at the top over here. See how it bows upward in the middle? And likewise here, bows downward in the middle toward the bottom. It's referred to as barrel distortion. That's a common flaw, that and field curvature for a lot of binoculars. You wouldn't necessarily see this dramatically looking at the nighttime sky, but terrestrial, it'll really bug you. Chromatic aberration or lateral color. Take a look at a, a tree uh, against a bright sky. You see a purple fringe on one side, sort of a greenish on the other. So false color or chromatic aberration. Things like that you're looking for. So that's one way to, to test binoculars to see exactly the, the level of the optical quality. As far as the center focus versus individual focus, I prefer center focus, but having said that, I love my, my 16 by 70 Fuji now with individual focus. And beauty, beauty is, of course, if it's just you using the binoculars, you set the eyepieces to focus for you, and then they're good to go. You might have to tweak it a little bit depending on temperature, but other than that, they're pretty good to go. But if you're sharing the binoculars with people who have different eyes uh, than yours in terms of focus, then probably the center focus is going to be a lot happier for everybody because trying to focus individual IP, especially if they're holding them by hand, can be a real pain in the neck. Whereas center focus, it's much more natural to use your, your fingers as you're gripping the barrels. Binoculars to avoid. Per, those that are claimed to be permanent focus, there is no such thing. They'll focus about 30 feet out, typically 30, 40 feet out. Everything beyond or everything closer is probably going to be out of focus, including the stars. So they're no good at all. Likewise, so-called zoom binoculars. Now, some high-end zooms do work reasonably well. I'm talking about the low-end stuff uh, because you have so many optics moving, they're never going to stay in alignment with each other. And so the view is going to be uh, cockeyed as you as you go through the zoom range. And so-called rapid focus, where instead of having a focusing knob, you have a seesaw lever like so, never going to sharp enough focus for astronomy. So those are, are not well um, designed either. As far as holding, the what type of mount do you, I'm getting to that. Uh, Tom has asked uh, um, as far as uh, binocular support. Let's talk about this, okay? Tripods, okay? If you want to hold the binoculars on a tripod, make sure it has a binocular mount built into it. I mean, that's, that's fairly obvious, but just to state it for the, for the record. You're looking for an L bracket of some sort. Now, some L brackets are better than others. Some are stronger than others. And so if you have lightweight binoculars, like my 10 by 50s, almost anyone will do. But my 16 by 70s takes a somewhat stronger design because they're significantly heavier. Also, take into account the tripod you're going to be using. Now, I'm six foot four. That's me. I'm six foot four. Most tripods are designed for cameras, right? Not a surprise. And most cameras are aimed more or less horizontally. And so the tripod is not going to necessarily extend enough to get the binoculars above my head. And so I end up looking like this when I'm using your average camera tripod. And that's not all that comfortable, okay? So therefore, what I have now is, that was a tripod I had back in high school even, um, which is long gone. But I have a, a Manfrotto tripod, which the head, which is it's a fluid video head that I use, can get upwards to seven feet off the ground. So that's great. I can, my, I have 25 by 100 binoculars as well. And I can get right under those eyepieces, look almost straight up at the zenith and be standing perfectly straight. So I mean, it kind of gets your neck after a while looking at that angle. But other than that, the tripod at least is not that problem. So that works really well. So you want to make sure that if you're going with just a tripod as opposed to a binocular mount, okay, we'll get to that in a second, uh, you want to make sure the tripod is high enough uh, so it gets the binoculars above your head uh, even when you're looking at the zenith. What about a flex flexible parallelogram? Okay, um, they're great. I mean, they're great. Uh, you can purchase some. You can make some. Uh, they're wonderful. Now, admittedly, those that you can purchase these days, and a couple of the manufacturers that sold these things for years and years and years have subsequently gone out of business or retired or whatever. And so now they're suddenly not as common on the marketplace as they were, say, 10 years ago. I think that's a problem. You know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. The good news is you can make them yourself if you're even halfway handy with a a pair of tools, you know, a drill and a saw and a couple of other things. Um, you can make them out of uh, just common wood. 
and they, they work very well as, uh, also. But you don't want to shortchange them. In other words, you want to use quality material. If you're going with wood, for instance, use a hardwood. Don't use, you know, two by four pine, for instance. I use maple or walnut, or, you know, something, something like that. Here's a nice homemade one that I found just online using just a, your basic weight set barbell down over here. Again, the binoculars can move up and down right over here. This is, this is the um, altitude adjustment right over here. He has a handle. They can move his binoculars up and down. The entire unit, if you're familiar with these, can move the binocular up and down for people of different heights without uh, changing the aim. It's just like a, a desk lamp. Desk lamp. You move the desk lamp up and down on its arm, and you get the aim of the desk lamp because it has these parallel arms, one over here and one over there, will move up and down without changing the angle. I love these. These homemade. Okay, this is what I'm looking at. Okay, the uh, I like the uh, star rocker over on the right hand side over there. But even on the on the left, all they did on the left, they took your basic anti gravity chair, as they're called, right over here, put it onto a lazy Susan, and have a couple of arms with a couple of bungee cords, which I think is really great. No counterweights involved in this case, and you move it up and you move it down, just like so. I think that's kind of a cool design. That 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 looks fairly simple. Even even somebody like me could probably make this thing. This takes a little more wood workmanship, which I'm I'm sure changed on. But uh, I love how it moves. It even even has a handle here to help move it around. And you steer it in both cases on the lazy Susan, essentially, which is what it is, um, with your feet. And then you move the binoculars up and down. Something you need to keep in mind if you're thinking about this sort of thing. Something you want to keep in mind is how big is your head. Okay, because you want the binocular so the eyepieces will come to your eyes but not poke you in the eye and not so far away that you have to lean forward to look through the binoculars while you're sitting in the chair. You want to have your head on the backrest while the binoculars come to you. See, that's why he has this on the right-hand side. See how it pivots right here? So that's the way to do that. I don't see a pivot here. I mean, it pivots up and down, yes, but moving in and out, I guess there's an adjustment on the platform. But moving it in and out could be kind of a challenge in that case. So lastly, I'm looking at, sorry, going back to the chat room over here. Uh, I think I answered uh, Thomas's uh, question. Um, Paul asked earlier, uh, gee, was sorry, 11 minutes ago, in addition to extra pu to pupil size diminishing with age, is data available on how the vitreous transparency ages with, uh, with age and impacts vision? I'm sure there is, Paul. I don't know it. If there is, I don't know. I was just looking at the exit pupil um, numbers. Uh, Gary earlier asked, uh, you mentioned a tripod. What's the best stable tripod and stable mount to use for binoculars for astronomy? So the same thing here. Uh, equatorial mount, nah. I wouldn't worry about an equatorial mount. Weighs too much. You don't need that sort of thing. Very basic. Up, down, left, right. You know, altitude azimuth is the, is the way to go, in my, in my opinion at least. Um, and finally, RJ Greenwood asked, I need to explain how to use diopter adjustment. Um, okay, sure. Let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, he makes a point which I didn't, which I didn't mention, but let's let's talk about it since he did. To focus the binoculars, let's say, and of course I'm I'm the perfect example. Your eyes are not identical to each other in terms of strength and in terms of focus. Your left eye and your right eye will focus differently in all likelihood. Yeah, maybe a little bit, maybe fairly dramatically. Um, understanding all that for binoculars with center focus, one of the two eyepieces, typically it's the right one, as I recall will also have an individual diopter adjustment. So you focus through your left eye, okay? Close your right eye if you want. Focus with your left eye, get a nice sharp view, then open up your right eye, and you're probably going to notice that the stars aren't in focus. Well, then you're going to take that diopter adjustment, which is right, the eyepiece itself is going to turn back and forth, little markings on the edge, plus or minus or whatever, so you can line it up that way. You're going to focus until, close your left eye so it's not distracting you, focus until your right eye is, has the stars in focus. And then you open up both eyes, and all of a sudden everything is in focus. So that's the diopter adjuster he was he was talking about, and that's a, that's a good point. Thank you for mentioning that. So what's up in the the sky tonight? Well, rather going to a lot of detail, I'm going to turn you over to the February issue of Astronomy, which just came out. I just got a copy of it the other day. Maybe it's an advanced copy. I don't I don't know. The January issue actually we ran a special issue, and so the columns actually were pulled to make room for the special issue devoted to deep sky objects. And I contributed to that special issue, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, if you want to take a look at what's up in the, uh, in the wintertime sky, the Cal mentioned before about Orion. Well, the February column that I did 
in astronomy focuses on different colored, colored stars in the winter sky. Now, you're familiar, of course, with Betelgeuse being reddish-orange and Rizo being blue and Aldebaran being orange also and so forth and so on. Capella may be yellowish and what have you. But there are a lot of other stars, uh, fainter, okay, visible through binoculars in the winter sky also. And I always kind of, I'm kind of interested in, in colors as opposed to just gray, you know, different shades of gray up in the sky. And so that was kind of the focus of my February February uh, column. Uh, a hint that I talk about in the, in the um, article, if you want to improve your, and this is true for, tel true for, uh, true for telescopes too, if you want to view, uh, improve rather your, your color perception, you want to slightly defocus the view. Just a, I mean, just a, eighth of a turn, maybe not even a tenth of a turn, just a little bit. And by just defocusing a little bit, binoculars or telescopes notwithstanding, the color will actually be saturated. At least your perception of the color will be saturated. And so you're going to see color, subtle admittedly, but you're going to see color, whereas if it's sharp in focus, you're not going to see. So just, just a tweak out of focus will, will improve your, your color perception in all likelihood. At least it does for most, for most people. And you might have to do that for some of the stars I talk about in, in my, my February column. Um, I'd also point you over to my, my book, Turin the Universe Through Binoculars. Okay, that came out in 1990. This thing is still in print. Hard to believe. Not bad for a trade book, almost 20, 21 plus years. Um, now, I'm not here to sell books, okay? However, I am here to mention that at no charge to you, if you have a PC, we don't have a Mac version, but if you have a PC, you go over to my website, philharrington.net, and look for Tuba. Turn the Universe Through Binoculars Atlas. It's freeware. A buddy of mine, Dean Williams, his name is, lives outside of Little Rock, Arkansas, came up with this, oh, it was 25 years ago now, back when I think it was Windows 98 it came out with, something like that. But I saw, okay, so over 20 years ago. Um, what it is, he took all of all 11 hop, 1,100 objects I list and describe in, in Turn the Universe Through Binoculars, and he took all the data and he put it into this star star chart program that he has. And we ended up calling it Tuba, Turning the Universe Through Binoculars Alley. You see, one of the drawbacks to, to the book is that there are no finder charts. And don't blame me, blame the publisher. They said they were going to produce them. And they said, oh, we ran out of money. Yeah, okay, thanks. So therefore, that kind of left a bad taste in my mouth, quite honestly, because I thought there should have been an atlas with it. But Dean solved the problem. And it's free. I have it as freeware on my on my on my uh, website, so you can download it now. It will run even with I don't know about Windows 11. It runs just fine with Windows 10, but you have to run it in compatibility mode. Okay, Windows Windows XP Service Pack 2, I think is what it was. It runs fine in that. So when you go to install it, install it under compatibility mode. That's what you're looking for, and it'll work just fine. So Phil, Phew. let me let me just interrupt real quick before. Good because I'm ending. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, this is just terrific. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to share my binoculars here. I grabbed them while while we were talking here, while you were talking. They're 1970 Tascos, seven by 35. There's no indication of any color on the lens, and my my case has two different kinds of duct tape on it. <laughs> well, I think I have the biological experiment going on that you were. You were certainly you might. talking about earlier. You might, yeah. Um, you know, the information you provided was just fantastic. I mean, we 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 uh, learned an awful lot about the the technology, and uh, you know, in particular for the for our club members, it's what to go buy and try to make a good decision, the cost point, and all that stuff. So, you know, we just uh, super information, um, and I'm sure we're going to go back and look at a lot of the things you you said on the on the video. So. So let's go back through the chat room, make sure we covered everyone's questions. I, I was trying to bookkeep too on paper. Um, you, know, you know, did we, there's all kinds of eye surgeries and other corrective kinds of things too, cataracts and LASIK, and you kind of touched on it a little bit with uh, Paul's question. Is there any more insights you have, Phil? On, Not me personally. Uh, I tell you, you'll see your ophthalmologist is my best yeah. choice there. So. Okay, and I think tripods and mounts we covered, unless uh, Gary or Tom, you have any further questions there. Um, and Tree, Tree had a great question, because mine has the center focus and the diopter, I think, here on the right mm -hmm. ones, too. So Yeah, yeah, they all pretty much all do. Yeah. yeah. 
and have for years yeah. and years. So anybody else uh, before we lose lose Phil here? Um, yeah, I've got a question. Okay. Sure. This is Ed Legrand. Uh, I got a about four months ago. I've got a pair of the Canon by 10 by 42 image stabilized binoculars. Those are the $1,500 ones. Um, I was interested in your thought about you getting seasick. I've noticed um, right away fine vibrations, and somebody else noticed it, and it um, it got me a little queasy at first. I'm past that, but I recognized it. And I couldn't find any, any other reviews that mentioned these this tremor. And occasionally I get total uh, stability, which is what I was after. But mm -hmm. there's often tremor. And is that what you were seeing? Or do I have defective binoculars is really my question. Well, that, that's that's my my thought. Yeah, exactly. Because no, I did not see that when when I mentioned it was it was me that was tremoring. <laughs> it wasn't the binoculars. Uh, so uh, it was just my, you know, kind of, you know, I'm, I'm trying to hold my head steadily, understand that, of course, but the binoculars were steadier than I was. So and that, that was the sense that I got. So you think the tremor is my binoculars defective? It might be. I, I, I haven't had the chance to to review any others, and that was, yeah. I bought them, you know, I see that the, the club has a pair, but. Uh, um, I'd probably give Canon a shout. And see what they have to say about it. Okay, that sounds great. Like, yeah, I, I might contact them and, and see what's going on because uh, if it's if it's a, a common thing. Now you said it locks in. Um, how can you give a percentage of time? In other words, you know, of, of what I would say times, is how many times does it actually work? What I would say is it it eliminates two thirds to three quarters of the shake, but okay. it converts it into a fine trimmer. Yeah, um, mm. I'd give which, them a call. Okay, thank yeah, you. I appreciate I that. Do. Yeah, that's what I would do. Okay, so, great. Something going on there. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay, if you have still a few more minutes uh, with us, Phil, we'll sure. keep asking you questions. Sure. Bill, Bill, did you have a question? Bill Burton. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Phil. Great presentation. Thank have you. Have you ever tried uh, Opticron? Binoculars are relatively new. They might be Chinese optics. I, mu I must admit I have not. But almost everything is Chinese optics these days, quite honestly. And um, okay. but no, I'm not familiar with them, so I can't okay. I can't really give an opinion. All right, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Centel. We have Celeste run 15 times 70 binoculars, and they keep fogging. What do we do to solve are they, the fogging problem? Are they okay? Let me ask you a question: Are they fogging inside or outside? Outside. Okay, uh, and the objective lens is in the front. Yeah. Okay, here's what you want to do. Um, I got a, I got a quick. If they're 15 by 70, let's see, 15 by 70. This might not work with them, but you, you're going to get the concept. Um, with my, with my 10 by 50s that I have that suffer from that also, um, I'll take a couple of soup cans, okay, a couple of Campbell soup cans, and uh, I'll, I'll either paint or somehow flock the inside with flat black, either flat black paint or fat, uh, flat black. Um, adhesive back Velcro, you know, felt of some sort rather, that I'll put inside. And I'll use um, typically as window foam insulation strips inside to fit them over to the over the front of the barrel. So I'm essentially having an extension in front. Okay, it's a dew cap. And that'll that'll work pretty well for you. If you're a little bit larger than Campbell soup, there's always Progresso, but uh, I, I'd look for some sort of a cylinder Okay, that you and some. I'll tell you the truth. What I did once, in fact, this was up at Cellophane, not last year, but the, uh, yeah, it had to be last year because we, it didn't run in 2020 with the pandemic. So it had to be last year. I forgot to bring my my um, do do caps I made for my my 16 by 70s. I thought, geez, now what am I going to do? Fortunately, somebody had a couple of old file folders, Manila file folders. They didn't need. Well, between that and the magic of duct tape, I was able to come up. You know, Jerry rig a couple of extensions in front that admittedly they got awfully wet as the night went on because it's high humidity up there, but they worked fine and the lenses didn't fog up. So you want to put something in at least one and a half diameters, whatever the, the um, diameter of the, the outer diameter of the tube is, uh, one and a half uh, times that in front. And that'll really take away the doing problem. Can we also use dew caps from a telescope? Oh, sure, if it fits. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you could buy them also. I mean, I like to make stuff, but uh, yeah, you could buy them and just make sure it's a, 
you know, good diameter and go with that. All right. Yeah, good question. Eric Snow? Yes, thanks. Um, have you tried any of the ultra wide angle binoculars? Like, I think I have a pair that's like two by 54. Oh, those things, the, the, yeah. the super eyes. Yes. Uh, look up at the sky. Yes, yeah, the super eyes. Um, I have not personally, okay, but I know enough people who know what they're talking about to get some sense. And they, they seem to work really well for what they do, okay? Uh, but uh, don't expect them to be, I mean, they're binoculars, yes, but the magnification is so low, you're really not going to see things, you know, small things bigger. You may be able to, you know, penetrate a magnitude or whatever deeper. That's true. But that's really what their purpose is. So it's, 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 it's a somewhat different purpose than your more traditional binoculars like I was talking about tonight. But uh, I think they're very interesting. Yeah, I have a pair. I really like them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If from a, a light polluted, you know, sky, you can see a, a lot more stars. A lot more stars. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think they're pretty cool. Let me ask you, though, with, with yours, um, is, do you have to hold them by hand? Yes. Okay, because um, Vixen makes, a, makes a, a set that, at least over in Europe, I don't know about those in the U.S. I, I think the answer is no in the U.S., but over in Europe, they actually come with a headband. Which I think oh. is a great idea. Just put them on, have the thing go around your head, and you walk around with these things coming out of your eyes, and and you're you're off to go. Uh, so I think you know I'm, I'm thinking of goggles going underwater. You know, goggles, <laughs> cool. something like that. So that's what they really need. It's something to strap them onto your head, and you can just walk. You around may look a little things. odd, but you might look. Well, little... I've been accused of that before for other reasons, but uh, you know. But it's I, dark I, outside, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter <laughs> what you look like. Yeah, no one's looking at you anyway. <laughs> but uh, I, so that, that's that's that'd be the one thing I would do if I wanted to get them. I have to make sure I have to somehow be able to put a strap on them. It's a good idea. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Uh, I will go to Nick. A couple more questions here, Nick. How about Michael? Michael Brock. Hey, I'm wondering if you could put your website on the chat. Uh, I just tried to duck over and. I got a sure. 404 error. Did you? Typing did not did not work out, I guess, here. Hang on. That's my name. PhilHarrington.net. There you go, there. Got don't it. Go to, don't go Thanks. to PhilHarrington.com. PhilHarrington.com is a singer in California. You don't want to hear me sing. Okay, so it's, it's got to be .net to get there. Okay, cool. How about Nick? Back to Nick. Is there anyone else that has a question? For Phil, Robert, one more. Robert Ryan, do you have a question? Oh, let's go back to losing my chat. Um, Rosetta Rachel. Stone had an interesting question. Go ahead, David. No, somebody in the chat room by the name Rosetta Stone had an interesting uh, question. You can scroll back. Okay. Uh, back a little ways. Do you happen to know if any of the space missions utilize something like binoculars rather than telescope? Uh, that I don't know. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not uh, okay. sure about that. How about Robert? Okay, I'm sorry. I, I was off. The uh, go-to program for binoculars with the uh, chips and the, all of the, if I, um, why can't I uh, see something in the sky that I want to go to? So if I understand what you're asking, in other words, does somebody make a go-to mount for binoculars? Yeah, or in the binoculars themselves. You can, well, the, you'd have to aim the binoculars. Right, so you have to put on. So the mount is what's doing the aiming, not the binoculars oh. themselves. So uh, is there a binocular mount with go-to built in? Not specifically for binoculars, but you can certainly jerry-rig something with any go-to mount, and you put a pair of binoculars on it instead of a telescope. Now, I'm thinking of some of the stuff that I, I Optron makes, for instance. I could I could see putting the binoculars on one of those little cubes that they make well, um, I, instead of a telescope. Holding them, and I say, what am I looking at? Oh, I see what you're saying. A, a, a binocular that talks to you. Yeah. That's what you're talking about there. Um, not that I'm aware of. Nobody makes that, no. Thanks. Sure. Anyone else? Um, 
While you're thinking of a question, I want to make a public service announcement for Novak. Um, Alan Figgett pointed out that next month's meeting is the same night as the Super Bowl. So I don't feel like competing. <laughs> uh, I'm probably going to look for moving that meeting to either the following Sunday, which would be the 20th, or move it earlier. So we'll we'll clear all that up um, in emails and chats and whatnot, but we'll we'll go out and see if we can find an alternate date. Our Phil team's not going to participate. I I do know that much anyway, but still mm -hmm. it'll steal away our audience, I think. Yeah. So all right. Any final questions for Phil? Yeah, Phil, this is Nick. Uh any input on bino viewers for telescopes? Um since you know so much about binoculars in general, you know, I've jury rigged uh, stuff from microscopes and looked through other people's mm -hmm. bino views, but I'm interested in what you think of Yeah, them. they're 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 good as far as they go, Nick. Um, understand of course how they work. It's essentially a beam splitter. So you have right. you have you know one path of light that you're now splitting into two. Okay. So therefore they're not true binoculars. True binoculars, you have two independent um, optical um, uh, instruments, uh, you know, together. Okay. So, so therefore, having said that, they're great for the moon. They're great for brighter planets. They're great for brighter objects, brighter deep sky objects. Depending on the aperture of the telescope, uh, you could define brighter as one thing or the other. Uh, but if you're, but if you're really going for a threshold objects, in my opinion, uh, you're going to lose. Depends on the unit, but maybe in like a half a magnitude. Um, so if you're going for a real threshold object, like something. Um, Horse Head Nebula, for instance, which uh, I do challenge objects on uh, cloudynice.com every every month, and uh, the, the Horse Head is is the is the January challenge uh, this year. But if you're going for the Horse Head binoculars, uh, Horse Head through uh, through uh, Bino Viewer rather, you're you're gonna have a tougher time with it than you would with the same telescope, probably without the Bino Viewer. All other things being equal, but uh, for bright stuff like the Moon, I mean, it, it it's it's like you're in orbit. It's they're wonderful. You know, absolutely. So, you know, understanding their limitations, they're, they're really terrific. All right. Well, Phil, thank you so much again. Yeah, my uh, pleasure. Terrific information. Uh, and we'll see a spike in binocular sales, I'm sure. Yeah, so. we, can, <laughs> we can hope, right? I get no commission on selling binoculars, so <laughs> yeah, I'll right. you know, make that plain right yeah. now, okay? Yeah. Well, uh, certainly a great start for Novak 2022. I uh, thank everybody for attending.